And just my new work schedule. I seem to only be able to get out of bed to go to work and that's it. <laughs> hmm. I'm not looking for something I would do. I can't remember what the hell it was. All right. Jax, what's new in your world? Well, <clears throat> attraction and mastery. <laughs> attraction and uh, mastery, okay. I met a guy about four months ago that mm -hmm. it's moving forward, but <clears throat> I have some reservations still, of course. Um, but he is, he lived in Ukraine all his life until about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he is one of the sweetest men I've ever known. And he's been pretty, pretty solid all the way through. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is I don't, I can't tell if he's, you know, some my mom always told me is don't date a man weaker than you because you'll destroy the relationship. And I'm like, okay, but how do I continue with this and find out, um, I don't think he's weaker than me. He's a little bit of a drinker, which when he be, when he drinks, he becomes this marshmallow, right? Hugs to everybody. But how do I keep from messing this up with my past and my reservations? And I'll tell you exactly how to do it. Stop trying to not mess it up. Huh? Stop trying to not mess it up. Just let it happen. Yeah. Because you know the first thing that happens, one of the first things I always hear about people who, who are gonna who are messing up relationships is how do I not mess this up? Stop trying. Just just be you. Let the let the relationship evolve. If it's gonna grow together, it will. If it's not, it won't. Well, if nothing else, we'll be really good friends. He's, I really like this guy. Yeah. He's a little and, older. Than and again, I you know not to not to you know speak ill of your mom, but did your mom have a successful relationship? Not a one. And why are you taking relationship advice from her? My mom? Yeah. I'm not. She's dead. What I'm saying is your mom always said, don't date a man weaker than you. Oh. Did your mom have successful relationships? The answer says not a one. And yet here you are taking the <laughs> relationship advice because she's your mom. Look at before you and I, I had this conversation just like yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, with uh, another one of my megas. And I say, look, man, don't take advice from people who've never been there, who, who don't have what you have or have never had what you've got. You know, if I if I had a dollar for every person who's given me advice about my business, who's not in my business, has never had my business, is trying to be in my business, um, I, I wouldn't need my business. <laughs> Broke. Right? You know, yeah. it's, it's very, and there's this problem that we have a lot of times is that, is that um, we get, we become very, very accomplished in one area. Because we're accomplished in this one area, we suddenly think it generalizes into all these other fields. Right. I call it I call it academic arrogance, right? Um, yeah. Which is gotcha. dramatically similar to Dunning Kruger, which uh, Dr. John Lachrette used to call the supreme confidence of the ignorant. <laughs> right? I like that. Don't take advice from people who don't have the results you want. Right. So you know, so the moment somebody starts giving you advice, look at their track record. Right. And if they if they have a, a a profound history of failure, do the opposite, <laughs> right? Well, part of the reason, you know, I haven't been with anybody since Terry mm -hmm. and I'm, my brain's going in a million different directions, but you're Maybe right, you're I horny, Jax. relax and let it go. Could it be you're just horny? <laughs> Well, that could be, but I'm not going there for a while yet. So. <laughs> okay, I'm just I'm just being politically incorrect. I, that's you what know, I'm jumping on the first guy I met. 
I mean, well, I don't, it doesn't sound like you've jumped on him yet. Well, I don't mean that way. <laughs> I want to. <laughs> take step. your time. Have fun. Just follow, follow your heart and follow your instincts, right? But what I'm saying is if we're it's, – it's important that, you know, the Buddha said it, and I'll say it again. Don't trust anything because you read it in a book. Don't believe anything because it's old or because somebody told you. Test everything. But one of the things you can tell, from, you know, from all of our profiling training and everything else, look at the person's track records before you accept their advice. Right. Okay? Got it. And, and it's, it's always, it's, it's never steered me wrong. It, it really hasn't. And so, but the thing is, is when you're in these, when you're in these relationships, remember that every relationship starts out as two people just having a good time. Right. It doesn't start there. It, it doesn't have any business going any further. Every short, every long-term relationship started off as a short-term relationship. Well, you know, the funny thing about this guy is he speaks uh, very little English, enough to get by, but he, he and I just, we meld. I mean, and, other people have trouble with talking to him and I can, I, you know, I'm learning body language, so I get it, you know. So it's really helped me in this relationship and he's learning English pretty well, but. Yeah. It's got a waste of Enjoy the process. Take your time. See where it goes. If it goes somewhere, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's the problem is attachment. We get too attached too quick. And then we become fearful. And then we hold on too tight. And then we do all the things that we said we were not going to do to screw up the relationship. So let it happen. Right? Okay. Yeah. Thank right. you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, let's go with Heather. New and exciting. Um, <clears throat> more of the same, you know. Um, I can see up your nose in that background. Oh. Well, <laughs> get away. <laughs> um, there. There. Um, work, school, the things, um, hiking, all just doing my daily practices mm -hmm. going on. Um, I did have to have cortisone shot in my knee after the week of qigong mm -hmm. um, and been dealing with kind of the side effects of that do is you have any is it possible your 18 rules were off maybe your you're structure while you're doing all that standing i'm sure it is but I, I mean i don't know the structure well enough to know what i'm doing so i've just quit using their practice and I went back to the practice that I know because I know how to do my practice without hurting myself. Okay. That's fair. Um but like as far as like the physical stuff with do you have any recommendations for like the steroid stuff, like the side effects from that, like racing heart rate, that kind uh, of stuff? Spin it, frame it, breathe it. The basics, of course. The basics, yeah. And a lot of a lot of purging. Right? A lot of uh, you know, the the dredging stuff that we did. Yeah. You know, you do the old man in the tide pool, um the six healing sounds, probably good good again. I think that's gonna purge and regulate the system is gonna help. Okay. Yeah. Which which book? That's all in book one, right? What's all in book one? Um, the dr the dredging and like, if I want to go read up on the 18 rules of posture, that's in the first book, right? It's in a bunch of the books. Um, I, let, me, let me look really quick, see if I can find it. 18 rules of posture, I know is going to be in the Taoist Nagong book. Okay. Uh, which I don't know if you have or not. Uh, I think I might have the electronic version of that because it's on the, um, Amazon where like if you have a membership on Amazon's Kindle book, whatever, you can download and have 10 books at all times. And I think I have that. Um, book one was... Is that the green one? 
see if I can find 18 mobile posture here. Right now I've got somebody's Hoi Yin staring at me, which is bizarre. For those of you who don't know what the Hoi Yin is, it's the perineum. Uh, 18 rules. Well, it's not me this time. <laughs> See here. Try. Um, you're probably gonna have to look around, but try pages forty-one. In and around pages forty-one, there. That, that, those are. Um, it's a chapter on the Tao Yin, which is you know the Qigong and 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 mudras and things like that. Um, that might have something in there. Um, also, you can look at chapter three, uh, page 189. This is actually not on the 18 rules, but it does show uh, postural deviations and things like that. And so there's, you're probably in and around those, in and around those areas. I'm, I'm just scanning really quick through this. Um, it's a big fucking book, so I don't have a whole lot of time to look, but um, yeah, I would let's see it. No, um, yeah, I, I really can't help you much more than that um, without an extended amount of time. There's actually, I think he actually has a video just on the 18 rules. If you wanted to go by the, by the, by that, it's probably not the most exciting video, but it would go probably in excruciating detail uh, into those aspects of it. So, sorry, I couldn't be more help with that. But oh. um, that was helpful. Just kind of knowing which book to get. That's the hardest part with all of this stuff. <laughs> well, again, I, I'm just guessing, but I know there's a lot of stuff on posture in the first book. And I'm sure there's way more in other books as well. Because like I said, he repeats himself a lot. And that's one of the things that I'm seeing how he's actually hiding the information. Because he is. Uh, he's making it practically impossible to learn from a book. So uh, it's pretty interesting. But, uh, well, that's why I have you, so you can <laughs> sort it out for me. <laughs> what are you trying to say, Heather? What are you trying to say? <laughs> I'm saying you're smart and you know how to put it together and make it easy for me. I rattlesnake colors and I know things. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go to Susan. <laughs> so, you know, in manifesting like you're supposed to vibrate at the level of the thing you want and you're supposed to believe as if you have it and and all that right there are a couple of examples that i know of and people that i know or have known that really go against that and they nag at me sometimes um, when it takes me more than 30 seconds to fall asleep, which isn't very often these days, but still. One of them is a memory of standing with a guy named Garth Brooks mm -hmm. in May of 1997, which you may or may not remember, probably don't, was here of the Central Park concert in August of 1997. And I had just met him. There were a few of us standing around talking to him. And the topic of that concert, that plans then concert, came up, right? And what he said was, we'll see if anyone shows up. And he was not kidding. Mm -hmm. And he actually, he wrote his, he's been working on his kind of memoirs through anthologies. And he has expressed the same thing there. Now, there were about, um, they, there was, they couldn't really count them, but they thought there were about a million people that showed up to Central Park. Mm -hmm. The other one was a family friend who really had like scarcity consciousness 
and died a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. um, like I handled her estate and there were estate taxes involved. It was a couple of million dollars. And I just don't, I don't understand quite how it is that people who have not just not a strong belief in wealth or you know success in a given endeavor but really an anti-belief if you will how does that work thoughts i don't know for every for every law of attraction rule out there you'll find exceptions okay you know it's just and that's that's but I, I will talk about one thing is and, and this is again David's personal experience. You know, a lot of people say, imagine you already have it, imagine that you already own it. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that work. I've never seen that work. Elaborate. What do you do? Um I, I, I place an order with the universe and just wait for it to be delivered. And I go about my business, which is kind of like you go to, when you, it's like, it's, when people say, imagine you already have it, it's like going to a restaurant and imagine the food is already in front of you. And it is, and it becomes different rather than placing the order and let whatever mechanisms in place to deliver the order, do its work and just go about your business, work on, you know, do work, call people on the phone, whatever you're doing to move through the world until the food shows up. Right. Um, right. So, you know, as much as I like what I've, the little I've read of Neville Goddard, or, or, or people of that ilk who say, imagine you already have it. I don't think that's what they meant. I think people are taking it a little bit to the, I think what they meant was, imagine that it's there, it's coming, but it hasn't shown up yet, but it's, it's you're just, the order is gonna be delivered. So you, you place the order, it's in process, it's coming, you know, uh, because I just, I just don't see it playing out. And, and again, that just could be my limited, perceptual filters or whatever right but my, my little magic mantra something will happen always causes something mm -hmm. happen, right um but the, the mantra is something something will happen not something happened <laughs> which are, are something, right you know it's, it's so um but you gotta remember that there's a lot of people who make a lot of money because they're terrified of being poor right there's a lot of people who whose idea of being poor is having less than seven figures in the bank. Okay. Right. So all these little rheostats and there's, you can't, you can't judge yourself by other people's life or experience. It's really a, a, a fool's game to do that. Ultimately, you can look at people and what they've accomplished and model their methods but you don't know what their karma is. You don't know what their, their history is. You don't know what their true set points are and things of that nature. And so you have to take what's useful and, and, and modify it for your life. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I do know some things about that one person and actually her family did have money. Yeah. But um, and I'm betting, I'm betting that the scarcity mentality that she was operating from, she got from her parents. She, I think so in a lot of ways. Yeah. Her mom continued to work. Her mom was an heiress and, you know, so was Barb as far as that goes, not as much, but still, yeah, but not, I mean, not to the same, not to any, like not a billionaire, not even born a millionaire or something. Most mm -hmm. of what they got, they didn't move and they paid off their house and, yeah. Gordon put a lot of money in in retirement, and he had. He's from he had, the Warren Buffett generation. Yeah, and he had, you know, he had life insurance and all that stuff. But I don't know; it was just odd to me, and I wondered if you had a. There's a great book. There's a great book I came across called "The Psychology of Money." And uh -huh. Unless you think it's about getting rich, it's it's really about the mindsets that people have that what we think works versus what works, and it's it's a really interesting interesting uh treatise on it you can get it on audible you can get it on kindle um okay it's it's really it's very thought-provoking and i think i think more mo everybody on here um should at least listen to the book and decide if they want to how it applies to them if it applies at all but i think it would help a lot of people right and everyone knows garth's a little weird so <laughs> whatever 
Anybody who goes by two different names at the same time. <laughs> it was just always it was so it was weird when he said it, and then it was like weird when it happened, and then and then when I read it and I remembered that conversation, you know, it was like, but how do you do this when you're so convinced? that it wasn't going to work. He's not that well, way I about think, everything. I, I think, I, I think you, in, it, with, with, with someone like Garth Brooks saying so, that, I think what he was, I think, I don't think he was expecting nobody to show up. I think he was just wondering how many people would show up. And that, and, you know, the same, yeah, the same yeah. sentiment can be embodied in, 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 or a different sentiment can be embodied in that phrase. So I'd be, I don't, again, I wasn't there. I didn't hear it. So I, I really can't speculate too much. I, if I ever get to talk to him again, uh, one of these days, I'll ask him. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me see about. Let me see if I can find this book really. But I, I think I only have it in Audible. But psychology. No, I think it's only. In, I think I only have it in my Audible, which I don't have in front of me. So, but I think it's actually called the Psychology of Money. So, for those of you interested in it. And no, I don't know the author off the top of my head. I'm not even sure how I found the damn thing, but it found me. Could be, could be Morgan Housel. Um, guess I could look in my Audible app and see what it's got to say, but then I'm going to lose my Dungeon Crawler Carl book. I'm like totally re-binging the whole Dungeon Crawler Carl series. If you have, if you, if you like lit RPG, it's hysterical. So. It's kind of what I do to take a brain break from all the intense Chinese medical crap I'm always up to my eyeballs in. Uh, hold on a second. Let me see if I can find this. I think it's Morgan Housel, but. And I've got all these pop ups coming and I'm going to get out of the way. So just bear with me here. Yes. I think my pet moss just showed up. Yes, it's Morgan Housel. All right, uh, let's go to, oh, there's Laura. I didn't see Laura sneak in. Mandar the Mighty, you're up. Oh, I'm up. You're up, buddy. I hear an echo. Um, what should I ask? That's a great question. What should you ask? Yeah, why am I echoing? I'm not sure that you are, but somebody. The system. Okay. Um, okay. So about in a dating context, uh -huh. if this is a typical question, well, why did you break up with your ex? Uh, it's, it's a very common question that I get to hear. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't want to answer negatively. So... What's a good, good, good feedback? What, what's a good response? And how do you frame it in such a way that you set up a standard for them? Well, you know, me being a smart ass, <laughs> I just look at her and say, uh, why did I break up with my ex? Because she asked me about my ex. Uh, there, there it is. You close the chapter right there. <laughs> Good job. Right. Or another variation is because she kept asking me about my ex. <laughs> By the way, that might be called reflexively apply to self, Mandar. <laughs> reflexively apply to self. Is that one of your fourteen reframe patterns? Yeah, I have to go back to that. We. That's the. That's the curriculum that we don't review a lot no we don't <laughs> i'm talking personally so um and then holly wants to ask if you don't have an ex i mean for me it doesn't apply but okay if you don't have an ex um 
Well, then that question does it doesn't matter, Holly. Come on. I just say I would, I would again because I'm a smart ass. That's what I do. Yeah. So, you know what? Maybe Holly is drinking. I'll be honest with you. I am pure as driven. Show I'm a complete version. I've never had an ex. Mm-hmm. With them. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, a visual is worth a thousand words, isn't it? Exactly. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe an- another. That's a great re- response, actually. Um, well, again, because people are going to do weird shit, right? And chances are, if they're asking you about your ex, it's because they want to talk about theirs. Right. And unless it's strategically useful for me to get them to access memories of their ex, I don't want to go there. Yeah, you're actually <laughs> right. People are um and, and I maybe I'm sorting for narcissistic people, but narcissistic people tend tend to ask this question. And I I'm the I'm the last I mean, I'm not really interested in knowing about their ex. Mm-hmm. Because, <laughs> because then now we are going to talk, go on a negative um, conversation route. And I don't like to go on a negative. Um, well, again, I remember when you're, when you're doing converse, you know, when you're doing attraction work, it's all about yeah. you, 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 you have the templates that I showed you. They work great and they let you get to know someone really, really quick. So when, when, when people start asking things like that, it's either they're looking for an excuse to talk about theirs or they're trying to knock you off your game. Uh-huh. And that's, that's kind of how, when it, strategically and tactically, that's really um, the primary reasons why somebody would want to do that. Or they, they, or they see the, or one other positive, they see themselves in a relationship with you and want to know how it's going to end. <laughs> it's, it's uh it's it's weird how in a dating context people tend to like future pace oh, how this relationship guys do it guys do it pathologically before they make an approach. Women are doing it on the first date. They're 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 running scenarios with you. What kind of a father you're going to be? What kind of a husband? A provider? They're doing they're doing all kinds of crazy future pacing shit. Fortunately for us as men, we disqualify ourselves <laughs> by talking about ourselves way too much, and so they they come to the conclusion pretty early, right? Unless they're unless they're shopping for a guy with potential, in which case they'll give you all kinds of benefits of the doubt. But um, uh, Nathaniel, so, go ahead, Mandar. So he, Nathaniel is asking, how would you use X anchors to your benefit? I don't understand the question, but I'm assuming anchors that have used on your X that you would use on your new new target or your new. You're going to have to give me a context because bidding on the context would change what I do with it. All right. Um, do you want to, I mean, Nathaniel, you can e- extrapolate your question because even he's I don't after, understand. He's up after you anyway, so he can ask it. Okay. He'd uh, ask it, yeah. All right. Uh, so my uh, next question is, I really want to go on the emotion route. <laughs> um. But uh, how to regulate emotion? Okay, since I'm on the dating context, in an attraction context, or in a p- persuasion context, let's say on a with a client, um, and and you're you're actually right. I mean, I, I don't have to say it. Uh, I'm beginning to go through this experience where okay, sales and attraction. Okay, I see a lot of similarities now, because uh, <laughs> now okay, they're they are buying me before they buy the product. Absolutely. Uh, so how do I regulate my emotions in real time um, in an instance when uh, I'm in, in, the, in the flow of conversation and I forget, okay, I have to maintain my state? Because mm-hmm. it happens once in a while when I'm so involved in the process that, I, that I'm no longer in control or aware of my state and I still want to regulate my emotion. Get back to posture and breathing. You know, were you were you on the AMA uh, last week? I think it was, or a week before, when Dave was talking about how he went out socializing for the first time, and he got into this really great conversation. And the minute he found himself starting to lose his state, he would just change his posture. And he was like completely back in control of the conversation. Did you catch that? If not, go watch the 
the YouTube uh, AMA from the last one. You'll, you'll, you'll hear him talking about it. He basically, yeah. his posture of reading, and he dominated the entire conversation. Okay. And you, and you already know this from training because whenever you do rapport wars and we have people m intentionally mismatch each other or match each other, what happens to the conversation? Mm. Right? This is the whole thing. 99, in, in my experience, when I, when I watch people interact, the first thing that goes to shit is posture. The moment your state changes, your posture changes. And, you, and then now, you, now you're trying to will yourself to hold on to a state that your posture is no longer supporting. You know what happens when you try to do that. So when two people are in this uh, discord, mm -hmm. have, do you have, you've also noticed that they, they are um, opposite in posture to each other? Uh, they'll either be a lot of times they'll just be intentionally mismatching people or um, yeah, you'll see one, one will be leaning in the other will be like back. Like you'll see them have very, very uh, confrontational posture. Some pe sometimes people will play the rooster where they're actually like, they're up like this and the other guy's up like this and the person's trying to get higher. I call that the rooster, right? Um, uh-huh, okay. You know, uh, but that's that's usually right before things are gonna come to blows or one person's gonna push another. Uh, going back to like, um, Nathaniel was doing an AMOT, you know, asking about AMOT questions. A lot of times when somebody's very belligerent and they're AMOT, you, they'll get that, that that puffed up energy you know kind of a gorilla energy right these are again it's an attempt to, to make themselves bigger take up more space to appear more alpha more dominant right and so people who are in conflict now now it's stronger yang wins right whereas a lot of times you can just reverse the polarity and, and change the postures and, and just dissolve a lot of that stuff but the first thing i'll go is your posture this is what i told you guys killer influence that the way to control the frame is by controlling posture and body feelings Posture, body feelings, breathing. Yeah. So I've I've never written this down before. Amog. Uh, alpha male, like, other guy. Alpha AMOG's male, other guy. Yeah. It's another guy trying to to come in and and out alpha you and basically disqualify you as as somebody who's uh, from the person you're trying to impress. I don't see it too much anymore, but I don't go out to nightclubs. And it, it happens quite often in nightlife. And yeah in social scenarios and, and yeah, it's very easy to combat so yeah i just okay and i, I, I metaphorically I, kick him in the nuts and we're good <laughs> okay all right yeah uh that's it for me Thank all right you. Nathan, you're up well i should probably close the loop with the question about the anchors so okay. when you mentioned the x I was remembering both of Kendrick's dark side courses mm -hmm. and how potentially bringing up the X would obviously cause them to elicit emotions. How would you potentially utilize those emotions for your benefit? Maybe anchoring them to an X or, or no, no, not to what's an X, out? but maybe. Okay. First thing I'd ask, what's my outcome? What do I want to accomplish? Uh, well, in this scenario, it would be to close or to get a date or, uh okay so, so are we using the boyfriend destroyer or are we using like the pattern like the door boyfriend destroyer okay boyfriend destroyer is really really simple um all you have to do is elicit where they store boyfriends or they're glad they got rid of or people that they thought were right for them once but found out they weren't then you tell a story about your friend debbie and you just you know move your move their move the picture of their boyfriend into that area Right. And it was sometimes mm. somebody's the right, and you're like, you have this guy that you're seeing and you really like him. And a lot of times we think that he's the right person, but sometimes something just flips and the picture just moves into another space. And before you, know, you see all the things that you didn't agree with before that were so much like the people you left, that you were so happy that you left. And that gives space for someone who can really fill your needs in a way that's really um, goes much deeper and more profound. And mm. I think it's amazing. You know, when you can look deeper and see that behind that is even something more preferable. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're able to hijack their spatial anchor of their, oh, okay. yeah. yeah, and then, okay, yeah, it, it, it makes a lot of sense because, yeah, obviously the Kendrick stuff goes into the patterns, but uh, you just gotta make sure that when you, when you have that, you just got to make sure that when you have them access those locations, you're not standing in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's true. Okay, cool. That answers that question. Um, 
the main uh, questions I had, I just, it was in regarding utilizing criteria and values and licitation in a sales process. Okay. Uh, specifically mine, um, I do a triage call 15 minutes mm -hmm. and then a one call close afterwards. Um, I sell basically government grants in Canada, gives them the business access to interest rate loans. Okay. So what I ask the criteria and value question on the triage call, that's my first question. Mm -hmm. um, and then my second question would be, would I ask the criteria values solicitation on what's important to them about getting the loan or first ask them what caused them to, to reach out in the first place and oh, get definitely. the reason for the loan? I would definitely ask them what made them reach out, but that wouldn't be my surface. That wouldn't be what I attack. That wouldn't be the criteria I attack. So once, so once I understand you better, once you've, you've gotten this, after you've been approved for this, right? Mm -hmm. And you've gotten that money and you're going to, and it's going to do this for you. I'm curious, once you have that, what's, what's really going to, what's, what's important to you about that? What's that going to do for you? Right. You know, how's it going to change your life? Could you add in the word personally? Yeah. Because, do for you personally? because primarily because we're dealing with, again, what is the person on the other end, the person who's making the decisions on the other end of the phone actually want, right? Mm -hmm. Because corporations are not run by, it's corporation is an entity technically, but it's run by people. And each of those people have specific emotional motivations. And so for each one of the people that you've got to deal with, you've got to extract their criteria so you can get past their gate. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And how would I utilize, because it sounds like I'm going to be doing this on the first triage call. How would I take that criterion of value and then utilize that on the second call when I'm closing them? Or would I re-ask the question because maybe their criteria has changed in between? Uh, the I first would and say, second. and just, and just, you know, for my, you know, I really enjoyed our last call. And during your last call, you said that, you know, the real, the, 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 what this was going to do for you was going to be X and Y and Z. And when you had X and Y and Z, it was going to allow you to experience one, two, and three. And I just want to clarify with you, is that still true? Or is there something else that's even more important? Mm about about this for you so we can make sure that we've got the best program or the best plan that's the right fit for you okay and then just future project them with the oh yeah everything you should presuppose they've already taken the loan or the business. okay cool yeah uh amazing yeah yeah that answers everything yeah excellent uh yeah the thing you always want to remember is that everything you do once you have the basic cpi and, and train everything you say should presuppose they've already taken the action Mm. that you want them to do and it's just it's just matter of fact as we begin working together you start noticing how this loan might help you with your a marketing few, few and now, yeah a few weeks from now after you really had a chance to, to 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 dig into the program and really start to see the benefits of having been able to invest the funds in the right place and it starts yielding the benefits from you that you've been really looking for you're going to realize that that huge weight that lifted off your shoulders and you're going to see the opportunities growing and becoming more easy for you to achieve because you made, because you, you, you've taken the necessary steps to get there. You know, and I'm speaking in very generic terms because I have no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> but, but the, it's the no. basic, thing. everything I'm doing is, is again, I'm, I'm in, they're in the future. I've presupposed they've taken the actions. I'm putting them in the benefits of it and having them look back to the orientation in time, having them look back periodically, on that decision to do it that they've made that they're already passed. So the fastest way to overcome an objection is to leap into the future after they've already into a, to an alternate timeline where they've actually taken the action you want and have them live it. Oh, I have a, you've reminded me of one last question. Um, I, I have a separate uh, objection handler I use with Jeremy Miner for a scam because I sell grants, right? Mm -hmm. The main objection I get would be scam mm -hmm. and they would, and, and the, the one I use is like, have you, do you know anyone in the past that has used a grant before? And they would usually say successfully and they would say yes. And I would ask them like, what makes you special? Like, and why would it would be different for you? And that, that usually works, but I'm curious, what would you do differently? Okay. What would your objection? Okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. If they object saying, hey, is this a scam? It's a government grant, but like right. money, it's a, it's a scam, right? The Canadian government grants, free money, seems mm -hmm. like a scam. Um, what would you use to object that? Would it be like one of the set of mouth patterns or would it be? Well, how would know, you... to be honest, Mr. Prospect, a lot of people feel exactly the same way you do. And many of them have discovered after taking a moment to really have this conversation and check up on the resources and the, the credentials I'm about to share with you, what an amazingly real opportunity this is. 
And as you do that, you'll realize that you have the same opportunity that so many other people who thought this was a scam at first also have. And you can get the same benefits that they got. Awesome, awesome. I'll this recording as soon as possible. Thank you. I appreciate it. I love this shit. This is, it's a good thing I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'd, have you. I'd have to have a search to remove my compassion center, but all right. Um, let's go to Stacy. I'm here. I'm just trying to get my camera on. Um, so I have, I guess I've got two questions, but um, one is about trance. Okay. And then, um, and, and but by the way, I want to just up front, thank you. Like, like I've had a like really amazing week and it's just, uh, I'm I'm grateful for all the practice, but it was so cool to actually get to work with people. And like, I had a plan, but I had to roll with it. And I didn't actually get all stressed out. And I was just riffing with things and, and it was rolling. And, and it was nice to be able to be in the flow and not feel a little panicked with it. Sure. Like, yeah. So... Uh -oh. <laughs> Like not, not that I couldn't do some of it, but to not have to like really stress was yay. It, and they, I got like amazing results from people, and I even got like hundred dollar tips and stuff. Which oh, look at you! I'll take. <laughs> yeah. Oh, girl. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, Stacy. Go, Stacy. Go, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> Win winning. Um, so my my first question is about trance. Mm -hmm. So I was like doing more of that like kind of surrender thing, and I had somebody on the table, and I've been trying to unpack what the hell happened. And I realize you probably can't totally give all the insight on it, but I know I didn't fall asleep. I was very aware of the room, mm -hmm. but I was fucking gone. Like, mm -hmm. gone. Like, everything went, like, white. And the only thing I can, I can explain it as is similar to when I do deep channeling and I go to the sacred... Um, Celtic tree groves and retrieve messages, which I wish somebody would fucking record me when I do that, because I have no idea what the messages are that I give them, but I come back and it's like epically life-changing for them, which I'm I'm happy. That's my job. That's what I'm doing. I'm I'm happy to do that. But it's was that same type of sensation. I've been trying to unpack like what's the difference? Like if I sleep things go to black mm -hmm. when I go to that type of thing things are white so that's probably the only different qualities that I could mm -hmm. distinguish yeah. the white out phenomena is very very uh common mm -hmm. when people go into deep level meditation and their shen goes and it sends okay. up with the taiji pole and, and my client said that she felt this amazing amount of energy like going through her third eye mm -hmm. and her head and everything and when I, it was like a, a switch flipped and I was like, and I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I was watching her body, like releasing all this stuff and do massive amounts of twitching. And it was an amazing session. And she was just like fucking goo when she got off my table. She like could barely speak, but she's like, and I'm like, are you okay? And then when we've established she was going to be okay to drive. And she's like, I, I, I can't even talk. She's like, not that I'm not capable. There's just no words. And she's like, she gave me an extra hundred dollar tip. And she's like, I'll, I'll see you same, same day, same time in two weeks. And walked out and I was like, it was just so, so weird. I don't know. Can you give me some insights? Cause that was bizarre. What kind of insights do you want? Like, 
I guess I guess I'm asking you, like, is that okay? Is it yes, like okay? Yeah, because like, what happens is like if you're if you're if you're doing the way we teach, where you're you're surrendering to the divine and you're inviting yeah. the divine to come in and work through you, then merging with that energy will call it well again, you're you're also do you also do a lot of channeling. So um something was working through you, that's all. Uh, okay. Cause it, like, I guess there's a piece of me that was like feeling guilty that like, I che I, I checked out on my client. Like but I did, but I didn't. You didn't check out. You just stepped aside and let somebody else take over or something. Okay. Over. Hopefully, hopefully the creator or one of your higher guardians that you work with, but no. I, I will tell you that experience has given me a whole other appreciation for the other steps that you teach besides the the invocation because now I have a whole different appreciation for why those are so important too. Very so good. yeah, like yeah. okay. Part so my, if that happens of, again, just go with it. Yeah. As long as as long as you know you're better off for it and the client is better off for it and you you've prepared the space. And then you clear the space when they're gone. Yeah. Okay. Because, oh. like, I'm grateful, but I, there's also a part of me that's just kind of sitting back going, like, this is awesome, but it's also like, what the fuck? Like, now, here's a question. I, I, here's a question. Yeah. Is that ego talking? Because there's a part of you that feels you didn't do it, so you feel bad. No, because it's 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 also there's this other flow that's been going on too that like I I accomplished like two big goals that were impossible. Like I set out there deliberately impossible ones, and then I kind of forgot about them. And it was like a few weeks ago, I was like, "Holy shit! I actually did what I thought was impossible to do." So and and other cool shit is coming out of that. Oh, so yeah, okay. The hardest right. thing that, that's going to happen as you guys go through these transformations is dealing with the ego deaths that are inevitable, but also dealing with those trans those transcendent moments where things you were thought were out of your your abilities or without out of your range, all of a sudden they're just here because you tapped into something higher than yourself and letting go. And surrendering to that flow that's for a lot of us is the hardest part because we're so used to having our hands on the reins and, and driving and being in control of every nuance and everything that's happening and sometimes the most powerful thing we can do for control is let go of it and surrender to what's happening and just however this needs to manifest use me however you need to, you know to use me and, and and be okay with that right and that's one of the hardest things and again, I teach this shit and I still deal with it. I struggle with it, right? Um, and we're all going to go through iterations of that process, you know, where we have to just learn to trust that, you know, what, what's manifesting isn't completely under our control and it's not always going to match what we expect to happen. Okay. I, I think the other part of it is that it's also profoundly humbling. Yes. Like it's like the bigger it is, that's how you know it's the real. More humbling it is. Like yeah. like in some ways, it makes me feel smaller. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in a way, it will. But then you have to think. Yeah, but but it also makes you feel grateful at the same time. Yes. Right. Yes. And that's yeah. That's that that reverence that comes from being part of something greater than yourself, but knowing you were also an important part of that. Right. Why was I chosen? Thank you for choosing me to do this. Why was I chosen to be this 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 channel or this vessel for this healing? Right. And to, to, and to create this, you know, it's, there's all these things are going on in the back of your mind when when the divine steps in and works through you. And it's it's a really amazing experience, but it, it does bring tears to your eyes a lot of times. It, it, it's almost like trying to catch my breath sometimes. Yeah. It, it's that kind of like, oh, my goodness. And I suppose leading off of that, I've also been wrestling and trying to do some parts work with myself because somewhere in the spring, I developed a 
inner bully, I, I I guess. And there's an amazing amount of confidence in that part of me, like just very forcefully steps forward. And that part's also done some reclaiming of, of parts of my soul that went off. And, and I kind of sit back and look at it. And I'm like, well, shit, where'd you learn how to do that? Like, that was a very effective way of doing other stuff that I would have assumed that there were a lot of other steps, but even kind of going head to head with this inner bully, I found like just the process of doing some of this surrender work, working on other clients, mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's sort of like this divine feminine. Like I was, I think I had more fear of this other bully at first. And then like digging into the parts work, all of a sudden this like divine feminine mother energy came in and there's no fear. It's just like all of a sudden creating space for all of it. And now I'm like more playful with it, but it's like, it's a very strange thing. Even doing the, the parts work, I feel this whole other thing coming in that also puts me in awe. Like, I don't even know where it's coming from, but it that too is humbling to also kind of, because it, it's very intense and there are times I'm stepping back and I'm like watching myself, watching myself. Perfect. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track, I guess, is That's, what I'm asking. Absolutely. Okay. It's, it's. Trust the process. It's a wild, it's a wild ride. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it my, only my, gets my, Go no, go ahead. It only gets more interesting. Oh boy. <laughs> my my other quickie, I think it's a quickie question, is if you have any insights in navigating like dealing with people with like the identity thing. Because I I've kind of taken you literally on on some things and in, in crafting uh an identity out there and I'm like even dressing in it and I'm I'm finding when I'm out in that other persona and, and doing my more magical work and stuff it's the weirdest fucking thing to hear people telling me all these stories about who I am to them mm -hmm. and like it, it's it is very magical getting to interact even like with little kids it's yeah, we're I'm I feel like little kids interacting with me is like meeting me at a like they see me and they know what, what stuff is and it's it's a really cool space. It's the adults, like the grandmas that are actually showing up to ask me to take pictures with their their grandkids, but the grandmas are going all like crazy goofy. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden it's it's like I'm I'm not sure what to do with that, but it's is that just coming with the territory of other people interacting with this other identity? Okay. Well, what's the identity that you're 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 putting on there and, and what are they perceiving? What's your intention versus what's your outcome? Um also added into the the intention out there is to maybe add an otherworldly uh quality to it are they it, it's an identity and, uh -huh. are they perceiving that when you send it out or when you're when you're eminent when you're um i you know emoting that yeah and it, it's a weird thing because it it's also given me like i almost have carte blanche permission to do all sorts of shit that i didn't necessarily feel like I probably would have before which yeah. is kind of cool but I, I will even have people come up and ask me to like just spin around in my outfit and then they start doing it too and I had somebody else who even drove two hours just to meet me uh, and they're like well we saw your picture and we had to meet you because that's how I want to feel that's what they said okay so it sounds like you're moving full speed ahead just go with it just just kind of go with it is that what people really do they just like 
They don't make know up shit different. about other people, I guess. They don't know any different. Okay. Right. See, the, what yeah. you're going through is a projection issue because you think that the people that you're interacting with see you the way you see you, and they don't. They see what you give out, what you project. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I guess it's a, a weird thing for me because I'm seeing, like, if we do, like, a Superman and call it Kent or something like that, I really couldn't understand how people couldn't see Superman as Clark Kent. And I guess I've had that experience recently where they thought I was an imposter pretending to be myself when I didn't have my whole outfit on. Mm. And they're like, no, that's you're not her. That's because you were incongruent. Okay. When you put that outfit on, you're congruent. The inside matches the outside. Okay. Right? And that's really one of the things that, that we all want to strive for is that we want the person we, we want to be inside, the person we aspire to be or are, to match the exterior so that there's no need for artifice. There's no need for putting on identities or masks or whatever. That's, that's what everybody's goal is or dream is. Unfortunately, we live in a plane where that it's very hard to do. But every now and then you'll tap into it and it'll be magical. So keep going. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful. Laura, you're up. Ah, it helps if I can find the mute button. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I wanted to thank you. Um, the advice you gave me last week worked really, really well. Um, it it has definitely changed. I was really surprised how much it changed the that feeling of you know small and mm -hmm. threatened and you just you went just changing the picture sizes. So, and I really don't think I have any questions tonight. But I just wanted to actually thank you for very welcome the advice. It was you know it, it's it's so interesting to me how just the smallest changes in the right places make the biggest difference. Right. Um, so much of what we manifest on the outside and, and, and what we encounter is because of what we're doing inside. Right. Now, I, I can't take full credit for that particular technique. I have to get it. I learned that from Ross Jeffries, of all people. Right. Many, 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 many years ago, I've, I've extrapolated on it and built on it. But I think he caught it like one fucking time in a seminar. Um, and it just in fact, it was the very first it was the very first home study course. It was still an audio cassette of all freaking things. Um, he was teaching about laid back versus it was, it was really interesting. It was just like a 10 or 15 minute segment um, in the, in the audio course. And it just stuck with me as to how simple and, and, and how literal some of these things like self-image and self-esteem and, and all those things and the authority dramas that we play in our head all go back to how we make the relative sizes of the imagery you know, in our minds and, and all the things that, that I, other things that I probably added with that. But yeah, again. So I, do have, I do have one follow-up question for you. Do the picture, do those pictures get like, because I was so small when certain things happened and such a young child, does that have anything to do with why those pictures are those sizes? Absolutely. It can for sure. Okay. Yeah. Richard, Bandler, I think I, know, I might have told this story once. Richard Bandler used to tell a story about uh, a client that he had once. And he was a big professional football player. A guy who was like 6'5", six, 6'8", six, something like that. Just a huge, huge guy. And, you know, Richard would be sitting with this guy and the guy would be talking about his relationship with his father and how he's terrified of his father. And he's this big, scary guy and blah, 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 blah. And after going around for two or three sessions, Richard decides that, you know what, I think, I think we need to bring your dad in here. And the football player's like, no, no, please don't. He's, he's, he's you know, he's, you know, it just, no. And, and they went back and forth. So look, you bring your father in, I'm not seeing you anymore. And the guy's like, oh, okay. And so, you know, they set the appointment. The guy brings his dad in and Richard's expecting this, you know, seven foot, you know, Hulk Hogan motherfucker, right? And in comes this little scrawny dude. The guy's like six foot, maybe, maybe five foot nothing, right? And, uh, and Richard's like, 
WTF, right? And then what, and what's interesting was during the session, when the guy went, when the father went to sit down, the son who, who towered over his dad, he would actually sit below the eye level of his dad. He would actually like get on the, like kneel down next to the chair or, or shrink down so that the, rel the, the, the external relationship matched his internal one. And so, so much of how we view people, uh, remember that one of the prime directives of your autonomic nervous system, your, your true un unconscious mind, is to make your external reality match your internal one, right? And that, if, again, if you want to sum up everything, one of the prime directives of the autonomic nervous system is to make your external system, your external experience match your internal experience, right? And, and that's where a lot of this stuff comes from is, early relationships but there's also in my in my opinion a default mechanism about that's related to authority that when we when we find ourselves in a place um where we're not in control where we're not in power everything in that environment is going to look bigger i used to encounter this all the time i would go to martial arts seminar after martial arts seminar where i didn't know people and i walk in and everybody's it felt like everybody was bigger than me like I was the shrimp in the room. Then I'd work with someone and I'd find out I was actually more skilled or better. All of a sudden, they'd shrink. It's like all of a sudden, I was bigger than them. The moment I figured out that I had, um, you know, I was actually better at it, this stuff than them or, or whatever, all of a sudden, their proportions in my mind and in, in my, my visual field, I would actually feel them physically get smaller. Right. And so this is how I began to realize that it's not really about the person out here. It's about what we're, what we're doing in here. Right. If that makes sense. So makes perfect sense. And then when you add actual physical threat to a child to it, it probably just makes it more intense. Boom. Remember four to one. Remember if nothing else, four to one ratio, four to one negative to positivity bias, right? Yeah. It all, it all stacks up. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it's so interesting that you can you can take and move those pictures around and it will, um, you know, reorganize that, which is so oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. And I think there's a lot more you can do with that. But the fact that that mechanism exists is exciting. Uh, which you're, you're all you're, you're so far ahead of what the average human being knows about their own mind and body. It's, it's really kind of sad. Well, it's sad and exciting at the same time. Right. Uh, let's go in. I think Moss is on the phone, so we'll jump right to Karen. Hi, David. Hey. Hey. It's a quick question about the face reading. The earlobe, the first half of the earlobe is, if it's very, very, very thin, so thin that you can see the veins. What does it mean? The veins? Yeah, because it's the first half or the top half of the earlobe is very, when it's very, very, very thin. What does it mean? When it's very, very thin. Thin, thin, thin like a paper thin. Okay. So usually what happens is when the, when the earlobes are thin, you're looking at a time uh, in that person's life where there was a lot of scarcity things weren't, there wasn't an abundance of love or resources or attention or whatever. In the both ears? Well, if it's- Both it, sides? It could be, all right? It could be at the same yeah. thing at different ages or it could be a continuation from, you know, over a longer period of time. Okay. And what about, is there where in the face reading that uh, if a person was born with uh, several natural abilities, like a boy and Crescentian, Creorians, all this stuff. Like a very, very gifted. Is there any way, anywhere you can see in the Facebook that represents that? You usually see it in or around the third eye. The third eye will be very open. Usually have it to be very bright. It'll be, a lot of times it'll be flat because it's open. And uh, when it's flat, it means open? Sometimes, yeah, when there's a flatness to it, right? Uh-huh. Um, or sometimes there'll be a little indentation, but that can also be, you have to, you have to, you have to take it with a grain of salt because sometimes that can also be a jing, uh, a jing depletion, but a lot of times there'll be like a little divot in the third eye. 
Okay. But it's really not, yeah. again, those are just things I learned from Lillian. It's not uh -huh. just people who are probably very, very, you know, clear sentient, clear audience that their four, their, their third eye looks completely not that way. Mm -hmm. I know. Okay. And uh, what about like in the forehead when it's kind of more rounded? It means it's creative, right? More creative, more imaginative, more watery. Mm -hmm. So anything yeah. watery, uh, anything related to the water element, they're going to have a little bit more of that. So they're going to be a little bit more on the mystical side, a little bit more on the creative, imaginative side. Uh, if the eyes are deep set, then they're going to be a little bit more contemplative. Okay. And uh, if it's like a flat diagonal kind of, is diplomatic. Flat going forward or flat going, like, are you talking about like this one back or? Yes. Yeah, the other one, the other way. Okay, they're going to be a little bit more yeah. diplomatic. They're going to be very fast thinkers. Um, they're going to be tend to be fast decision makers. Yeah, but sim okay, so it's not necessary. Uh, yeah, fast thinkers, so it's not necessary. It's yeah, there are some. I see some creativity, but the person is very diplomatic. No forehead is very, very diplomatic. diplomatic. Yeah. Diplomacy is part so, of it. It's always what? Diplomacy is part of it, yeah. He's part of it? What do you mean? In other words, yes, it's part of what you just described, that particular oh. feature. Yeah, so that's why I got confused. If a person is diplomatic and uh, there's some creativity on the person, is there other places that I can see the creativity? Because this one I thought was, yeah, and it is diplomatic. The person is very diplomatic, but the is also also creative so i got confused you know i couldn't see the well, creativity. Here's, here's what i have found with, with this with, with this particular slant is the person's a very fast thinker they can uh -huh. think on their feet they can they can follow conversations in a non-linear way um because it to me that correlates very very strong with a um uh, fluidity of thought trait in uh, in handwriting analysis um so that's kind of where i see that kind of of creativity uh, other types of creativity oh. we've seen in the forehead in terms of like the roundness of the forehead, mm -hmm. like a watery forehead, uh, how much fire they have. Fire is seen in the in the tips and the points of the face. So uh, if they're more elf-like, they'll tend to be very creative, but a little bit more chaotic. Uh, if if they are more what? Sorry. Fire. Uh, fire. Uh -huh. There's different kinds of creativity. So Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, so when it looks like the the diplomatic one and also the creativity, he has, the person has creativity like a, for the words mm -hmm. and fast. Fluidity words. of thought, you call it. Sorry, so could you repeat again? Fluidity of thought, diplomat, diplomacy, yeah. Yes. So, so I was thinking maybe one is rounded. It's more like a for creativity for artistic sense. Would it be correct or... It could be for sure. You'd have to look at a whole bunch of people with those brown foreheads and see what they have in common. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That was clear. Okay. That's all mm -hmm. my question. All Thank right. you. Yep. Clarine, you're up. Hi, uh, David. Wow. I need help here because. Um, um, I'm a coach and I work mostly with uh, single moms. Single moms, okay. Yes, and uh, to help them, uh, what I say, is pacify their memories and, uh, you know, move on. Okay. So, well, I I, I think I, I do a very good job of it and uh, I can motivate them. I, being a single mom myself for about 22 years, so... But recently, I've come across some um, some some roadblocks for myself. So I can help people, motivate them, help them achieve their goals and stuff like that. But for myself, I think I'm, I don't know, for some reason, for some reason, I can't, um, I can't achieve my own goals. For example, recently, in total, I've written about four books. But I've sat on them. I published just one, 
and as I've said on all the rest, I created courses, all the content and everything available. But I've I've written four uh, four sales pages, but I've I've not taken any steps to market them. To I mean, I feel like something is holding me back. I don't know what. Something is holding you back. And, uh, yes, I've I've tried to work on myself. I, at this point, I don't know. I was thinking maybe I need something to brainwash me to be able to be more motivated than, you know, and actually put everything that I have out there. So, is um, it okay to, first of all, is it okay to, to to put these things out into the world? I feel so. I think so. And to the people who have read those books, you know, I've sent it to people to write, to read, to review. They are very positive reviews. I mean, they are so enthusiastic about it. But I myself, I keep changing things, judging things, modifying, restructuring, you name it. So, yeah. So let me ask you this. Is it okay to change that feeling? Yes, it is. Is there any reason why you might want to keep it? That's a yes. Close your eyes. When you think about that reason, notice there's a place in your body where that feeling starts, where it grows, where it spreads from. Take a moment, point to where you feel it. First impression. That's right. And I'd like you to notice that there's a color, maybe even a series of colors connected to that feeling and the reasons behind those feelings. What color or colors would that be for you? Orange. That's right. Now, if there were a picture floating in the space around you, clearing that represented that orange color, a picture you could reach out and touch, where would you reach out to touch it? Go ahead and reach out and touch it. Now. Excellent. Now, trace the outline of that picture with both of your hands so you know how big it is. And let's just, excellent. So grab the edges of it. Now, I want you to lift it up over your head. Move it out in front of you. Now let's make sure we've got the right one. Make the picture bigger. Tell me what happens to the feeling in the color in your throat. Does it get stronger or weaker? Stronger, yes. Okay, let's bring it. Let's make it small. Make the picture smaller. Tell me what happens to the feeling in your throat. Does it get stronger or weaker? Not strong, yes. Okay, perfect. Now, I want you to use that amazing imagination of yours that I know you have. I want you to put a big, thick frame, a big black frame or whatever color represents neutralization and safety to you. I want you to put it, make, it the, make the frame bigger than the picture. Now, you're probably too young to remember when televisions had real dials and knobs and switches instead of touch screens and remote controls. But I want you to feel on the base of that frame, that frame clearing, you're going to feel some dials or knobs like on an old style television. I want you to find the knob that controls the brightness or the contrast. When you find that knob, turn that knob all the way to the right until the image whites out completely and notice how that makes you feel. And when you've done that, after you've done that, turn the knob all the way to the left until the image blacks out completely and notice how that makes you feel. And then all I want you to do is tell me which one you like better. First impression. Which one's better? Mm. Don't overthink it. Just don't it. Is there a different color that would make it better? This kid is blue. Okay, go ahead and find the knob that makes it blue. Turn it all the way till it's as blue as it can possibly be. And then I want to take, want you to take the index finger of your dominant hand. And on that blued out screen in glowing letters, I want you to write, there were some lessons connected to that orange color that you've been holding on to that have been keeping you from doing what you want to do. I want you to write those lessons on the screen in glowing letters so you can keep all of the lessons and let everything else go. Now, as you start writing, clearing, I'm going to keep talking and you just keep writing. Some people know exactly what those lessons are and they just blast them right on that screen. Some people 
have no conscious idea what those lessons are, but the part of them that created this block or this issue or this, this package in the first place, that part always knows. So let that part express itself through that finger on that blued out screen. Now the screen will scroll like a tablet scrolls or a tablet software scrolls. So you have an infinite unlimited writing space. I want you to let all that information flow out of your mind, out of your body, onto that screen so you can keep all the lessons and let everything else go. Now, some people draw pictures, some people draw squiggles. Every now and then you get someone who's really angry and they just start writing F U, F U, F U on the screen. Some people write with both hands at the same time, like they're writing Chinese and Hebrew at the same time. However, your body does it, however, it wants to express itself, just let that finger flow, let those lessons go. So you can keep only the lessons and let everything else go. When you just keep going, if feelings and emotions come up clearing, put them on the screen too. When you know you're done, and only when you know you're done, you just nod your head to let me know, and we'll continue with the next part of our process. Again, get it all. Doing great, keep going. When in doubt, write it out. Yeah, big. Excellent. Reach up, shrink that frame down to the size of a postage stamp or even smaller. And Clarine, I want you to notice how the feelings in your mind, body, and soul begin to shift and change as your other than conscious mind grabs a hold of that little tiny stamp, begins to move it up over the top of your head and back, back beyond the horizon until it disappears completely. And I'm sure you know the sound a hammer makes when you're when it's banging in a nail. I want you to hear it nailed back there for all eternity and possible come back. When you know it's nailed back there for all eternity and possible come back, test it. Clarine, try to bring it back and notice what happens instead. When you're done testing, scan your body, notice how different you feel. Tell me what's changed. I don't feel I don't feel anything in my throat anymore, but my heart is warm. Is that a good thing? Yes. <laughs> All right. So yes. <laughs> well done. Bravo, love. Bravo. Thank you. You're very welcome. That's what we do. All right. Let me unpin you. And let's move on to Christine of Slady. Christine of Sutton, you're up. Christine going once. Christine going twice. Uh, did we, Christine three times. All right, let's go to Moss, who co-opted my co-host position. I'm still uh, handling a client call here. Okay, Moss is doing business for Planet David. So we're going to go ahead and do open uh, open forum. We're going to take, uh, we got about, I'll not give it another 20 minutes or so. What other, uh, anybody have any other questions they want to ask or whatever? I do. I don't know if Jackson Heather did as well. Go ahead, I'll. <laughs> Things are going, but um, uh, so if you were doing, uh, I've never been good at letting, letting go of, shall we say, letting go of the ideal, something that uh, you wanted to have, but um. Like, for instance, say there's somebody you wanted to date, they didn't want to date you, mm -hmm. or maybe they even did want to date you, but you found out they were an asshole and that's not what you thought they were. Mm -hmm. What force would you use to uh, mourn the loss of that ideal in order to be able to let it go? To mourn the loss of that ideal? 
or or is there a better way to get rid of it or to uh, let go of it? My first impression is start with identity by design and uh, the, the transformational triad and then move through the regression protocols. Uh, and what specifically comes up is chair therapy. Okay. Can you be more specific? <laughs> uh, well, you know what I mean when I say chair therapy, right? In general, yes. And so uh, one of the things, remember that when we create an, an ideal, what we've created is an expectation. Mm -hmm. right it's not that person's fault it's ours we created the expectation right so we're mad at them for not living up to our expectation mm -hmm. so we need to dialogue with the part of us that created that expectation and re and re reprocess it right so. it's not a person it's a dream that you wanted to have what who would we put in the other chair you or whoever taught you that ideal in the first place. But first, I would I would do it in a non-directive way. I would say there's a per, there's a, there's a reason I've had these feelings. These, um, how young was I when I first had these feelings? Who was it with? Who taught me these feelings? They're going to be in that chair. One, two, three, and boom. And you put the spirit body of the person uh, in the chair, and you talk to that that avatar, and you work through it just like normal chair therapy until you can get some kind of level of forgiveness and resolution. But it might be it might be as simple as just using the transformational triad, right? We tend to think that because these things are deep and they're old, that we need the the nuclear options or what what seem like these very long intense processes when all we need to do is ask the right questions. So instead of writing down the lessons, maybe for you you could write down the expectations or something. I'm trying to think how to adapt it. <laughs> what is it you want instead? Well, what if it, you can't get what you want? that's what you're coming to terms with. Okay. But if you can't get what you want, is it because you don't have the skills because it doesn't exist? Is it because your, your, your way of going about it is too narrow? What's the reason you can't get it? Because to age, like the age to be able to have it is past. I would start with framing it. Okay. I would start with framing it. And then based on what happens during the frame, what, what, what insights you get from it, I would let that guide where I go next. Okay. I'm betting 90, 99% of what you need, if not all of it is going to come from some form of holonomics or regression. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? Uh, Jack, you're up. Well, I'm not sure if I've talked to you about this before, but when you took us through that uh, Kabbalah meditation a long time ago, it was about two years ago, mm -hmm. um, that was a really open, free space for me. It was mm -hmm. amazing. Um, I'm trying to do what this guy suggested unbox yourself how do i do that how do i how do i open myself up i had an incredible experience here a while back um meditating and i haven't been able to achieve it again i need to go back to that mantra too i haven't done that but in my meditations i just i want to grow i want to expand and move beyond i mean i've my whole life i've been been able to sit there and my body just takes off without me <laughs> or my mind spirit and i go through incredible events and and see things that are accurate as hell but i can't experience that consciously i can't uh i can't seem to go into it with that being the outcome i i do but i don't get that far well my intuition is that you've been doing it in a way that's not really systematic okay probably yeah, the vast majority of people who I, are having these experiences they're doing it largely because they came in with those switches flipped on which is why sometimes they can do it and sometimes they can't 
there is tra there are training processes and systems in place to move people through these different levels. Um, and those take work. And but the reason they were kept secret is because if you have access to those teachings and you actually do the teachings, everybody can do it. Right. If you're able this time. Most people don't have access to that, so they they get a piece here and a piece there, but it's haphazard at best. Plus, they don't know what the what that terrain or that landscape looks like, and so many times they take a wrong turn or they misinterpret a phenomena that's generated, um, and they don't understand the negative aspects of it or the the peaks and valleys of that that progression. Right. Uh, and that's what a lot of this. But the biggest thing I see when people have a, a, a very transcendent experience. Yeah. Meditation, oh, hold on a girl, second. Should take with you. Oh. Right. When people have these transcendent experiences and then they revisit the meditation and they try to go back. One of the most powerful things that holds them back is the previous experience. What I mean by that is they're they're trying so hard to get back to that experience that they're blocking themselves from anything else. Part of the reason is a form of hypnotist disease because or, or, or smart person syndrome, because there's a part of us that remembers the previous experience and is evaluating the current experience in this at the same time you're trying to have, in other words, you're, you're trying to go backwards and you can't. Every meditation, you gotta understand that every, every time you go into a meditation, you're a different person. And so your manifestations will be different. Right. And so the worst thing you can do for yourself is go into a meditation process and try to make it like the last one. Okay. I, um, yeah, I've been so doing this. Another form, it's, a, it's another form of holding no? on. Right. Another form of what? Holding on attachment. So just relax and, and let things whatever you happen. get. Is what, yeah. Whatever you get is what you get. Allow yourself to just be fully present, fully absorbed in the process, and it goes where it goes. And you'll 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 start to notice as you go deeper and deeper, and you, your your practice starts to become more systematic. That there will be peaks and valleys in in your progress, right? Um, and you'll start to notice, like one of the things Sifu Johnson also says, that when as you you'll go through these valleys, peaks in your meditative process, and then it will start to diminish. And it'll diminish and it'll diminish and, and either it's like you're trying harder and harder you're getting slow, you're, you're getting further it's almost like the, the faster you go the more behind you you get right and what you discover is those are the moments that are leading up to your next ego death but if people don't realize that they get frustrated they don't they they, they want to quit they think what they're doing is not working so they start doing something else they don't realize that if they just stay the course and keep going they'll pass through that veil and the next the next sequence, the next phase in that that process, and they'll be more transcendent and have more light than before. But if you don't recognize that that's the way the pattern works, uh, on top of everything else, um, it, it's 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 tough, right? And, and and so that's the thing is one of the things I've seen is that the most profound changes come from just doing the same thing <laughs> until you change. But most people don't uh, do. That. Go ahead. Uh I, yeah, I've been noticing uh, in my meditation more white light, and uh, I see some crazy stuff in my meditation. Is that normal? <laughs> I mean, uh, flames and fire and water and... Uh, I mean, is it normal to see this stuff? I don't know that it's abnormal. Okay. I've learned to accept whatever I see is what I'm supposed to see. A lot of times what I see is I don't understand what I see or I don't I, or I think I know what what I'm seeing. And then I find out that there's another reason why I'm seeing it. You know, uh, my teacher used to talk about um, one of his colleagues who would go into this minute. He was a, a Jesuit priest. And for 20 years, he would go he, he, he would go into his meditation and he'd get outside of his body. And as he was going to get outside of his body, there would be this gigantic spider in the astral plane waiting for him and every time he see it, it would terrify him and he would just bounce back into his body for 20 years this went on and then one day he he was meditating and he moved, moved up out of his body and he saw the spider there and he's like if a jesuit priest could say this fuck it and he's like whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen right and the spider jumped on him and started biting him and it started you know just biting him all over the place and stuff like that and the next thing you know, he's surrounded 
by this brilliant white light and he's standing in front of his guides or in front of his higher teachers and, he go, and his teachers are going, took you long enough. Because that, that was one of his guides. He was, he was waiting at there to, to sever all these cords and connections so he could rise to the next level in his process. But because he saw a spider and automatically thought, ah, get on! Boom, right? Back into his body. Right? So a lot of times what we encounter in these, these altered states, it's, it's, it's not what we think. And it's not until you face those those challenges and those Rubicons that you'll get act, you'll qualify for the next level. And this is something that you, all of you who are, are endeavoring to become more psychic or, or more spiritually aware or empowered or whatever it is, whatever words you want to put to it, you got to understand nothing's free. Yeah. And, I, I... you know, you hear me say this all the time. Always be testing. The universe is always testing you, but it's not a, it's not a punitive thing. You know, the way my teacher used to put it, everything, it's very fair because all your higher, your, your, old, your higher brothers and sisters, all the people up there who are your guides and your teachers, they had to do it too. They had to do it too. That's how they got there. Right. And so you're going to be challenged. You're going to be tested. You're going to be confronted with all the things you don't want to look at, all the things that make you want to run. You're going to be like, oh, it's too hard. I, it's not, it, why does it have to be this way? The world is trying to punish me. It's there. No. You're here to refine your spirit. And this is the process. Right? Some of us have things that we can, we, physical issues that we need to overcome in this world. Sometimes we're not meant to overcome them physically in this world. Sometimes we're meant to, to experience them. So we know what it's like to have that because in another incarnation, we were on the other side of that. I get that. Right? But it's not, and this is the important thing, it's not, it's not cruelty. It's not punishment. It's, it's teaching. Right? Right? But the consciousness that you bring to these, these experiences will dramatically impact your behaviors and the belief systems that you, you strengthen. And that will determine the consciousness that you move through the world in. Right. And, and so, again, but but in your case, the thing to understand is persecution a test. Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, that's, you know, that's where my craving for red and fire came along is in my meditations. Mm -hmm. And uh, even now, you know, I crave red foods. I crave the color red. I want to wear it. I don't have any, but, you know, it's like this thing with fire. Um, and speaking of spiders, I used to be terrified of spiders. I still don't like handling them, but they are the only insect that comes in my house I won't get rid of. Mm. Um, partly because Native Americans believe spiders are good luck. Mm -hmm. And a lot of places, um, and they do, they're, they're, I feel like they're really good luck. I, I love having them here because they help keep rid of everything else, but it also... Um, it's also a way of me knowing that my fear is going away. Good. <laughs> the way my house is right now, I got a whole bunch of house pets. <laughs> All right. Christine, you're up. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Wonderful. Okay. Last week I, I sponsored and did, um, you know, hypno practice. That's what I'm calling it. Mm -hmm. And we went round and round trying to figure out what, you know, water, fire, water, or earth dams water, fire energizes earth. And, and I think we were arguing from different perspectives from Japanese to Chinese to the different, different, different different uh different um teachings on this are different ways because i think i think you know what i mean and and trying to equate 
well, what is air air is supposed is air akasha or is or is air air supposed to be akasha and also supposed to be metal because they say it's it it has to do with the lungs so we were all over the place trying to figure out this can you put some insight into that sure they're both one yeah, one of the things you're going to find that's going to be very complicated and frustrating is that every tradition and even even different monasteries within that tradition will often have different references. So the, the two that screw people up the most um, are, are wood and akasha and metal and air. Right. In, in the Japanese or the uh, systems in the Chinese, the classical Chinese medicine systems, um, metal and air are pretty much, and I should, I should I have to be very clear, I have to be very careful here, um, because the metal element is primarily a, a product of Chinese medicine, and it's most often equated with, um, with the air element, but in some, the more, um, Taoist traditions, the metal element is actually associated with the void or the, or the Tao. Uh, and so if you're getting into some of the more deep, very, very old systems, there will often be a little bit more confusion there. For all intents and purposes, the things I'm teaching you and the way I'm training you, the, the associations you want to use are um, fire, metal, earth, water, wood. And um, in some systems, the wood element is equ it equates to the void. Um, in other systems, it, it's, it, it's the metal element that equates to the void. Um, I would keep it simple and go with the, the, the one I've been teaching for years. Um, even though I'm learning the other one right now in the Chinese medical Qigong and stuff like that, um, it's, they, they actually still use both. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of weird. Uh, depending on whether you're talking about the body or whether you're talking about more of the, the energy or spirit bodies, it, it gets a little bit more. Things, things tend to, metal becomes more and more void or, or, or Tao or Wuji oriented uh, the deeper into the mystical traditions you get. Whereas with the, with the medical traditions, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty solid uh, that metal is equivalent to the lungs, which is equivalent to air. Uh, wood is equivalent to but we would, well, there is, it's only wood element. Which fire? Would be, huh? To fire? Wood no, no, no. Wood is, wood is on its own. Wood is, you know, fire is, is, is that. So. Um, yeah, but fire, would you, would you go through, also go through the, you know, the, what you say, I know wood or fire burns wood. Okay. Let me write, I'll write it down and you guys can take a screenshot of it because. If you just try to listen to it, I guarantee you're gonna you're gonna issue. So I already I already written down because I knew this question was coming. I've already written down the creation cycle. So now I'm gonna give you the controlling cycle. Okay, so, so there are a couple of different cycles depending. Oh, there's on many cycles, and that's again, you, it's, it'll screw you up if you if you don't understand that. Again, we haven't really taught you guys Chinese <laughs> medicine. Is, so. Well, I th I think this is why we were so lost in trying to uh, figure this out because we went on probably for at least a half an hour trying to figure out. Well, if all you want to know is the cycles, that's easy compared to yeah. that. So this is, this is how it works out. Okay. Okay. And again, this, this is, this is a functional, other systems will have slight, again, the Tibetan systems will have slightly different things. Some of the Japanese systems, but this is functionally what, how it plays out. In the, you have the creation cycle where one element strengthens one element. So wood feeds fire, fire feeds earth, earth feeds metal, metal feeds water. In the controlling cycle, fire melts metal, metal cuts wood, wood breaks up earth, And earth dams water. Okay, that makes much more sense. Thank you, because mm -hmm. we we were doing 
we were doing all that all that uh, arguing because we we've heard that before but we weren't able to do that so concisely because we kept on getting lost in the sauce mm -hmm. Uh, let's, let's do this real quick. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bum. Earth, metal. And finally. Water. Water, thank you. Right? Yep. So if we take, I'm just going to put these in, uh, in sequence here. You guys still, can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Okay. So the way this works, creation cycle, fire to metal, or wood feeds fire, fire feeds earth, earth feeds water, I'm sorry, uh, earth feeds metal, metal feeds water, water feeds wood, wood kills fire, or uh, wood breaks up earth, earth dams water, Water puts out fire, fire melts metal, metal cuts wood. And look what you have. Yeah, that's... You have a pentagram. Yeah. Okay. Does so a pentagram have anything to do with anything, or is that just a... Well, it's pretty interesting that, that both the Eastern and Western traditions view... Um, the pentagram as a protection symbol and it symbolizes harmony and balance within the elements. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because they do balance each other. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, Karen, you're up. And that'll be Mandar. Hi, there's a quick question. Um, if a person asks a phone for a phone number, how do you politely say no? Uh, say, hey, how about I give you my email and we continue the conversation that way? If they don't want it. Just say, I don't really feel comfortable giving my phone number out right now. Is that? Okay. 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 That sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mandar, you're up. So in terms of, um, I actually went on this rabbit hole with your, with your explanation to Jax. And the universe is always testing you and it's not always punitive. So uh, but according to my teachings, the new teachings I have, it's never punitive. It's always educational. It's designed to teach you something. Okay. And so I know I'm doing, is that doing a cause and effect thing? So is that the reason why we should also test um, our, our uh, experiences, our other people and um, our abilities because the universe is testing us? I think so. I think testing everything is a good, is a good way to go. I'm, I'm not a big, no pun intended, I'm not a big believer in faith. No, I, and um, I think I'm also getting there. I mean, uh, especially going through all of your trainings. I mean, it's challenged more, most of the things that I was indoctrinated with. And unfortunately, our filters, our male filters are extremely different than female filters. Big time. Um, and then I didn't know that I was looking at seeking and filtering people and even at work based on my own projections. And that's what also I learned at your school. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, well I'm, a big, I'm a big proponent, proponent of ABT, always be testing. Amen, brother. Give me an amen. <laughs> amen. All right, good. All right. Anybody else? Moss, you still up? Oh, Big Dave raised his hand. Go ahead, Dave. And that was really a uh, very 
awesome explanation of the five elements of cutting and just the simplicity of it because we we were looking at it over the weekend and and I was looking at it and I was seeing all these sort of connections of wow oh it makes sense how this would nourish this and how this would destroy this and mm -hmm. we were still we were mostly confused I think about um that it wood and metal were being called air and space and we were confused and I don't know um but I had known it as the fire, earth, metal, water, wood, whatever you just said. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyhow, um, so that was really cool. And it's interesting how on the on the diagram, it's always jumps one, like how it's, al it's always the exact same thing for the controlling versus the nourishing. Yeah. One but thing you also, you also have uh, you have other patterns. In it. You have like you have um, the creation cycle is known as mother's son. Um, then you have the controlling cycle. You also have uh, grand grandfather grandson which is it's a counteracting cycle where the, the elements actually flow backwards <laughs> trust me there's patterns upon patterns upon patterns and that's again i spent a hundred thousand dollars throwing that shit i better know it so <laughs> well, <laughs> you mean through your acupuncture training uh -huh. yeah. well actually i learned it before i went to acupuncture the reason i went to acupuncture school was because i had to learn it for my martial arts mm. i learned how to tap people using the create the destruction cycle to put them to sleep mm. And then I wanted to get better. So I went to acupuncture school to learn how to hurt people better. <laughs> but because of my, because I spent like five, six years, 10 years, however long it was doing this stuff martially. When I got to acupuncture school, I was like, I could sleep through my classes because I knew it all. But gotcha. I didn't sleep in my classes, but I could have. In fact, I'm probably the only acupuncture student who actually has live video footage of his acupuncture classes while I'm being taught. I still have them in my archive. That's what you have a rabbit of video is Diane. Huh. Um, so one thing that came up was when we were discussing the nourishing, um, it was brought up. Why would you look to harness the nourishing or the controlling side to influence another element when you could just basically try to harness the element itself so um if you wanted to uh increase earth element then you could basically harness fire and then fire would would nourish earth basically as far as that'd I be a classic mother-son process yeah so then but then what came up was well why wouldn't you just harness earth as opposed to harnessing fire to nourish earth um, you could. You can do that as well. So yeah. really all three are valid, basically. Again, it depends on your treatment protocol. Some people um, will just um, tonify earth. The problem, though, is if, you, if your earth is weak and you start to tonify it, it's going to pull more energy from fire. And if the, and if the, fires, if the earth is weak, it's possible that the fire is weak. Mm. If you start giving, you know, tonifying the earth, you're going to suck more energy from the fire element <laughs> that can create more problems. It's an interactive system. You got yeah. to the plumbing. Yeah. See, that's the thing is once I started looking at it and seeing all the connections, then I was thinking, okay, well then nourishing fire would then would or yeah, harnessing fire or whatever, however you want to say it, would then nourish earth. But then it's like, okay, but then maybe you need to dampen fire. So then you so it's like this constant thing. Well, here, here, here. If you want to get it just in, here's going, the, thing. The, 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 earth might, the earth might be weak because metal's taking too much. So huh. all, you, all you in that case, all you have to do is sedate the metal element and fire would get stronger or earth would get stronger because it's not getting sucked the life sucked out of it anymore. Which was the one that sedates metal? What sedates metal? Yeah. Wood. Oh, no, uh, fire. Fire um, melts metal. So, so if you think about it now. So that's if, the same thing earth, then. If earth is weak, right? Then it right. could be because A, the fire is too strong or, or not strong enough, or the metal is right. too weak. What's the common denominator? Right, metal's too strong, you mean? Yeah, metal's too strong and it's pulling too much energy from fire. So what's the common denominator? What will simultaneously make earth stronger and metal weaker? Then you fire, stronger you fire. fire. Fire and the system balances. Boom. Huh. So, but then um, one thing I was a little bit confused about, because like what, 
because I've looked into this a little bit nutritionally and I was a bit lost, but as I've kind of increased my understanding and actually I didn't really realize that this was going to happen, but starting to look at the face reading stuff, um, I am developing a greater understanding of the five elements. So then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay. Cause now you've got like sort of the personality element of it and sort of seeing that stuff, it just is clear to me. Um, but like, then the thing is, <laughs> I noticed that in eating, it's like I have some sort of an issue with spicy foods where like if I eat too much of them, I get headaches, even though mm -hmm. I love eating them, um, is what it seems. But I noticed that when I eat spicy foods, I have way stronger digestion. So it's like if I eat the spicy foods, I strengthen my digestion. So I always thought of that as strengthening fire. Um, not necessarily, no. But is how how should we look at it in terms of like if Earth is weak, let's say, mm -hmm. but then if the person gets angry at certain stuff, wouldn't them getting angry at stuff imply fire or anger is almost always a wood issue. Anger is a wood issue. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So, all right, well, I'll use that all to continue increasing my understanding on it. That's very helpful. Um, quick random thing that uh, came up too was you mentioned um, thunder magic before, mm -hmm. and I was just curious, what what is thunder magic? It's shooting thunderbolts out of your hands and killing demons. <laughs> uh Thunder magic interests me, I suppose. It's it's really after, cool. It's cool. After after lightning came down and struck my neighbor's house, and then my dog walked, and uh, which, by the way, I could like show a video to be honest, but the dog is quite literally like borderline jogging, and we're going on short walks. You go, boy! Way to go! Keep um, going. yeah. So excellent. <laughs> Mind blown. Film at eleven. All right. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks. You're welcome, my friend. All right. Uh, I see Teresa's here. Teresa, you have any questions before we adjourn for the rest of uh, our time? All right. Last call. Moss, you still on the phone? All right. You got a question or are you just hanging? Well, I guess for you, from a uh, sober, I'm gonna step outside because I can hear the echo and it's like mess yeah, breaking my brain. My door too, so yeah, it's like breaking my brain a little bit. Boss is um, literally downstairs working in the office. <laughs> so, from a clinical perspective, right? You can see my um, bookshelf, my my real bookshelf behind him there. <laughs> that's that's a mini bookshelf. The real bookshelf's over there. Um. Yeah, from a clinical perspective, right? Um, I was doing a session earlier, which was it went really well, and you know, like a lot of the time, like the intuition pops and hey, like do this, you know, whatever from all the tools or little tweaks, whatever else. So when you're when you've gone to advanced work with people and you're kind of doing more in depth stuff with someone you're seeing more than once as a client, do you still tend to default start with like transformational? try it and, and build out or is it kind of depending on what you're sensing and what what you've been working towards with that person um it's largely uh once i've gotten i've done four magic bullets safe place induction i'll do basic there's a feeling you've been having a feeling you want to change uh, i'll start with general negativity clearing back in the day i would go in the gray room and then i would just i would just pyramid off of whatever i found in the gray room later years i, I stopped doing gray room so much and i just went right through safe place induction and modified uh, universal solvent. And then I would say there's a feeling you've been having, a feeling you want to change, a feeling that has everything to do with why you're here today. And there's a place in your body where that feeling stored, point to where you feel it, and then turn it into a color. And then depending on what I'm going after, I'll start with a superficial intervention and then I'll just go deeper. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how I start most of the time too. And then that's what I was kind of curious. So you'll start with something like as simple as resolution frequency generator or just like spinning it or mm -hmm. whatever yeah. and then if i can get it know. if i can if i can get it with a super with a with a i don't want to i don't want to call it a low level technique 
but a, a, a non-invasive or a non or a blind technique and just nuke it there, I will. But if it's something that's that's long term, I'm almost 90, you know, I, I know going in that I'm probably going to wind up unpacking and attacking. But I, I'll start with something relatively superficial. So usually about a, usually about a level three uh, holonomic uh, uh, technique. Uh, okay. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. That's what I was kind of just just sitting there wondering about because I've been going back and forth with it, you know, just using all the different tools interchangeably. And yeah, yeah, I was just curious how you approach that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, folks. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Um, I did not stream this one to YouTube, so I'm going to have to upload it separately. So once Zoom is done rendering it, I'll upload it to the channel. Um, and uh, you guys will be able to go back and review it. All right. Have a happy Friday. Uh, we'll see you guys. Uh, let's see. When are we going to see you guys again? Um, I don't know. For those of you coming to uh, the Taoist Energetic Makeup uh, next week, I'll see you there. Good night. God bless. Take care, guys. Thanks, David.